Assalamualaikum and a very good evening to everyone. Um, today I'll be presenting to you on pandemic of the century, which is COVID-19, uh, which is, and I will tell you about what's, what we did in Malaysia. So my presentation outline tonight will be, where are we? Where are we in Malaysia? The crisis response, what, is, what was our journey thus far? What was the Malaysia's approach towards the COVID-19? And tying it all together is a digital response. And I also take this opportunity tonight to present to you five digital initiatives that we started during the COVID-19. This is the COVID-19 surveillance dashboard. This is as of June, a 10 June at uh, 8 p.m. last night. And if you see, more than 187 countries in the world are affected. And, uh, and the cases confirmed is 7.2 million. But as for Malaysia, we have uh, 8,338 uh, 8, as of 10 of June, 8 p.m. And, this, and you see the countries that are involved in this dashboard. What is the picture for Malaysia? This is the number of positive COVID-19 cases in Malaysia, as reported on 10th of June at 5 p.m. yesterday. Cumulatively, we have 8,338 cases with a cumulative discharge of 7,014. That is about 84% of the cases and total active still in the ward of 1,200. There are five patients in the ICU, however, none are ventilated. And we have about 1.42% a cumulative death, which is about 180. Today, we have another 31 cases reported. This is our disease outbreak response metric of Malaysia, where there are four phases, the alert phase, the early containment phase, the late containment phase and the mitigation phase. We, uh, we had an alert phase started on 16th of January this year, early containment on 25th of January, and subsequently we went into the late containment phase on 16th of March. We have not declared the mitigation phase. Our MOH Crisis Preparedness and Response Center or the CPRC the National CPRC was activated on 23rd of January, uh, which I have presented earlier where the alert phase was on 16th of January. And this National CPRC is responsible for all the command, the control, and the coordination of all COVID-19 programs and activities at the national level. We all, then we have the Hospital Services CPRC, which is responsible for coordinating hospital efforts in response to the pandemic. This was activated on the 15th of March, 2020. So we also have the state CPRC. There are 14 states in Malaysia and all states will have a state CPRC and the hospital operation room, which coordinates the programs and activities at the hospital level. These are the people behind the scene. What you see in the screen is uh, all the state CPRCs from all the states in, uh, in Malaysia including few hospitals, which is Hospital Sungai Bulo, the Hospital Kluang, Maips at the bottom, uh, which are some of the COVID-19 hospitals. If you see, we have, we have so many people involved in this pandemic. And of course, the main CPRC, which is the national CPRC and the hospital CPRC does the coordination at the headquarters level. And the center, if you see, are the maestros, the maestros that actually lead, led by our Director General of Health. The containment strategy of COVID-19 of Malaysia, we announced the movement control order uh, by, uh, through the Prevention and Control of Infectious Disease Act 1998, Section 11. This was announced on 18 of, 18 of March. And this was during the late containment phase of the DOM. The lead agency is the National Security Council, which is chaired by the Prime Minister. And if you see this containment strategy, we had four phases of movement control order, phase one to phase four. And we have the conditional movement control order for two, uh, from 4th of May. And from as of 10th of June, which was yesterday, we have the 
uh, recovery uh, MCO. So it was, it is actually a comprehensive, during this entire phase of the containment strategy, we had a comprehensive public health measures, whole of government and whole of society approach and comprehensive restriction and travel ban. And only essential business activities were allowed during the MCO phase. During the MCO phase, uh, even until today, we have what we call the enhanced MCO within the phases of high risk area, or sometimes we call it the red zone where the food essential is delivered to doorsteps and home-based medical care is given. This, uh, there is a strict uh, restriction of movement in this enhanced MCO areas. We also have strict SOPs for return to work, business and social sectors during the conditional MCO and the RMCO. There is a mandatory, mandatory quarantine for travelers returning from home. However, as of, as of now, the, the, the quarantine is now with turn into a home surveillance for two weeks. And at the end of the day is a new normal in all aspects of life. This is the uh, SIR modeling, which was uh, done on the 21st of May and uh, the reported daily cases until 8th of June. If you see the top graph, which is all cases, there are a lot of spikes that's happening, which is, which, uh, is contributed by imported cases from our travelers coming from uh, our Malaysians coming home. It's also uh, due to migrant workers, due to their living conditions, and also to, in, uh, to uh, migrant, uh, undocumented migrant workers, which are in detention center. However, if we, if we remove all these cases and just focus on the local cases, Malaysian citizen, you can see we have somehow have flattened the curve. And if the blue, uh, blue uh, zone is the model of uh, daily cases where we projected if the SOP is followed. And the red zone is the model of daily cases if the SOP is not followed. So right now, I think we, have, we are in, in the right trajectory looking at this modeling. This is the overall approach to our COVID-19. In terms of surveillance, prevention and control, we had uh, many public health measures, uh, including community and entry point screening, active case detection and contact tracing, that is the most crucial. Uh, we also had targeted approach uh, testing, which is uh, more targeted into vulnerable and high risk group localities and clusters. Cleaning and disinfection also continues. In terms of diagnostic and testing, we have enhanced our lab capacity which I will show in the next slide. Uh, for diagnosis, we use our RT-PCR and now we are also using our rapid test kit antigen. There are many, health, many labs that are involved from public health labs to the Ministry of Health, University Hospitals, the private and the Ministry of Science uh, mobile lab. For movement control order, I have mentioned earlier where we have four phases of MCO led with the lead agency of National Security Council. We have enhanced MCO, conditional MCO, and also the recovery MCO. During this recovery MCO, until the 31st of August, almost all economic, business, and social activities reopens. Isolation and treatment is the management of treatment of all confirmed COVID-19 and person under investigation. The strategy we use in Malaysia is we admit all positive cases. We also have screening hospitals and treating hospitals, quarantine and low treatment centers. Uh, of course, we monitor our uh, demand and capacity planning, hospital bed capacity, ICU beds, ventilators, PPEs, and so forth. Protecting our healthcare uh, worker is also our priority. In terms of communication, it's transparent, factual, and consistent. And there's daily press briefings until today at 2 p.m. and 5 p.m. 2 p.m. is by the, uh, by the senior minister who leads the National Security Council and the 5 p.m. is our, by our Director General of Health. There's various information channels, mass media, social media, hotlines, uh, emails, portals, health education and advisory and multiple community engagements. Not forgetting evidence-based approach, we have a national guideline and COVID-19 management and in the last five months, we are moving into version six of the national guidelines. Uh, we have guide, uh, treatment and clinical protocols guidelines, modeling and projection, health technology assessment, mortality review, and clinical trials and research. So this is an overall summary of the approach to the COVID-19.
this is our frontliners. If you see, it ranges from healthcare workers to the police, to the defense, to the immigration, to the lab, uh, to people in the ICU and, and civil, uh, civil defense and, and, and so on. So it's the entire uh, whole of society and whole of government approach to COVID-19. For the lab capacity, this is the picture from EPID, EPID week one to, to today, we are in EPID week 23. If you see uh, the numbers of lab has increased, we started with one lab and 300 tests per day. And today we have 50 labs, total of 50 labs with almost 35,000 tests per day. And uh, the, we have one, in the, uh, the Institute of Medical Research, which is the main lab, five public health lab, 16 Ministry of Health lab. University, we have 11 uh, university hospital labs, two from uh, hospital defense, one of Ministry of Science lab and 14 private labs. So our lab capacity has improved tremendously. In terms of hospital bed capacity and utilization, uh, we have total screening hospitals of 120. However, treating hospitals is, is 40. Our total Ministry of Health hospitals currently is 145. So we have 38 uh, Ministry of Health hospitals and two university hospitals that is treating uh, COVID patients. For the number of hospital beds is about 4,384. And we also have 4,000 uh, over beds in quarantine and low risk treatment centers. Our ICU beds is about, about 442 with total ventilators about more than 1,000. So the picture that you see here to, uh, today, the gray is the hospital beds, total hospital beds, whereas the blue is the hospital bed outside the hospital. And you can see the utilization rate, which is, uh, which is coming down. And uh, so the, the moment the utilization rate is coming down, what we do is we release the hospital beds and we focus more on the low treatment uh, center uh, beds. Most, uh, the asymptom asymptomatic and also the mild uh, COVID patients is now treated in the low treatment center uh, hospi uh, hospitals. In terms of protecting our health workforce, which is our priority, we have a pre-exposure strategy, post-exposure and also communication strategy. In pre-exposure, of course, the standard transmission based precautions, the PPE usage, hand hygiene and also declaration form. In terms of post-exposure, all healthcare workers are given priority screening and testing. Of they, they go through a risk exposure assessment. A lot of support and care, including psychology support, is given to them. We also ensure that so there is no service disruption, service continuity is ensured, and data management is done. In terms of communication to our healthcare workers, we give them regular updates, a lot of SOPs and guidelines, reassurance, and also press statements. COVID-19 has not only impacted the health sector, but it has impacted economic uh, sector, social, and, and many other sectors. So if you look into the numbers here, the economic impacts in Malaysia, uh, the GDP growth dropped between minus 2% to 0.5% in 2020, and also the uh, value of GDP losses. And the top uh, total job losses is, is almost uh, estimate, estimated to 0 0.9 to 2.4 million. So there's also sectoral impact and GDP growth in agriculture, construction, manufacturing, mining and services. It has in, in, uh, impacted the whole industry. So what the government of Malaysia did is we had four economic stimulus packages total, uh, totaling almost 300 billion started in between February 2020 to June 2020. And the first economic uh, stimulus package was more towards impact uh, to uh, alleviate the impact upon tourism industry and also the people-centric economic growth. The second and third one, which is called pre uh, uh, is is to protect the uh, people, the supporting the businesses, which is the small and medium enterprise and strengthening economy. The third stimulus package was an additional assistance to the SME. The fourth stimulus package, which is called Panjana, Panjana I think was just released about a few days ago, is to support the economy into new normal with three main trusts, which is empower the people, 
propel the businesses and stimulate the economy. Tying all together is our digital response. So if you see this picture here, this is actually six focus areas. First is the strategic and risk communication, community engagement to operational efficiencies, insights, infrastructure upgrade, and research and clinical trial. So our strategy is I, we have multiple new initiatives. At the same time, we also leverage on existing platforms. Under the strategic and risk communication, mass media and social media platform is used to, to disseminate information. Sentiment analysis is done. We also have call centers with the help of telcos, hotlines, and infographics. So a lot of community engagement is done through the strategic and risk communication. In terms of community engagement, there are multiple initiatives. Uh, the new ones are the community-based app, which is called My Sejahtera, which I will explain uh, in the coming slides. There's also a contact tracing app, which is called My Trace. We use social media and mass media channels for public information, health advisories, daily press briefings, and li live webinars. We also have uh, uh, industry support with, uh, to use e-appointments virtual clinics and virtual health advisory. So this is, uh, this is the community engagement we, uh, and how digital response is used in this. In terms of operational and efficiency, either it's for efficiency of the CPRCs or also the hospital, we have a new system called eCOVID-19, which is actually a data collection system. And another new system, which is the CPRC of hospital, which is used by the uh, hospital CPRC. This is more for demand and capacity planning system. Our facility-based system, our own HRS at KKM was rolled out in our uh, low uh, quarantines, sorry, low treatment center, low risk treatment center. A queue management system was introduced. The, all the public health lab system is called SIMCA, which is already an existing system and e-notification. To gain insight and foresight, analytics and visualization is very important. Uh, we leverage on our MyHealth Data Warehouse platform using the uh, GIS. We also have multiple dashboards at CPRCs, at the hospital, and also the National Security Council. Infrastructure upgrade, I think, is very important in, in digital response for COVID-19. We have improved all our connectivity to, all, uh, to the state CPRCs, to the hospitals, and to the clinics, uh, and also the quarantine centers. Upgraded our bandwidth. Uh, uh, we also improved the security for work from home. Multiple video conferencing tools is used. It's the new norm. 5G fixed wireless access was also uh, uh, given, and portable base station, especially at the quarantine centers. Some of the quarantine centers are our training centers. For research and clinical trials, there are multiple research and trials that's happening now, uh, which is led by the National Institute of Health. Uh, what there is in, on big data for modeling, epidemiological and drug studies. AI tri trials is going on for CT scan and X-ray in the use for diagnosis of COVID. Genomics, uh, molecular modeling is being done. 3D printing. Uh, was also, is also uh, done uh, during this time, especially for PPE. We had disruption in supply chain for PPE in the early days of our pandemic, and uh, 3D printing really helped us in this. COVID-19 e-learning is done weekly by the NIH, by the uh, National Institute of Health, mainly on clinical, uh, clinical and also public health uh, response. Myra is a, a COVID-19 health system response dashboard. So in our digital response, we will not be able to do this without multi-stakeholder approach. We had inter-agency, inter-ministry and industry support. So if you see the pictures today, the picture here, in terms of agency, there's multiple agencies and universities and World Health Organization that is involved in the digital response full support from the industry and also for infra and network this uh, with, from telcos and from Mampu, which is our ICT, the ICT uh, arm of the, uh, of the public sector and also all the other players. 
this is a non-exhaustive list and uh, all have come together to help in the digital response. So I would like to introduce you some of the initiatives that we did. Uh, My Sajatra app is actually to enhance community help through mobile application. There's 2.7 million users as of 10 of June. And it is an, it's an application that was developed by the government of Malaysia through strategic cooperation of multi-agencies, uh, the, uh, uh, the National Security Councils, the MCMC, MAMPU, and also uh, NAPSA, which is the National Agency for Cybersecurity. And this is to assist in the monitoring of COVID-19 outbreak. This app actually empowers the users to assess their risks and their uh, risks of themselves and their family, to get COVID-19 guidelines and also information of the nearest health facilities, and also will receive the latest information and guideline from a trusted source. This can be downloaded from the government uh, app store or from, or from Apple, Apple Store, Google Play, and also the app gallery of Huawei. In terms of health assessment categories, uh, we have five or uh, six categories from low risk to confirmed cases. So through this algorithm, uh, when the, when the uh, person downloads this, through the algorithm, they'll be categorized to any of these categories. There are also many other features and we, uh, the system is being, the app is being improved as we move on. Uh, there, there's QR code and hotspot tracker and then also SOPs for economic restart, especially, uh, especially lately, there are many uh, uh, standard operating procedure that's, uh, that is being uh, published. There's also a link to MyTrace. MyTrace app is actually developed by the Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation, which enables identification of people who have been in close proximity to an infected person using Bluetooth technology. It actually complements the MySajatra. So this has, is, this has been our main uh, app during this uh, COVID-19. To enhance data collection and reporting, we have a system called eCOVID-19, which is actually a digital form developed for data collection. And again, this is through a strategic collaboration between Ministry of Health, the National Security Council, and also the Malaysian Communication and Multimedia Com uh, Commission. There are six functions in this uh, eCOVID. Uh, 19, which from managed user to register patient, patient management, lab management, and also uh, the movement history. So the, what is in progress right now, we have migrated uh, many of the previous lab data. This, is, this system came in later uh, in the pandemic. Integration work is happening now. So if you see in, in the picture, there'll be integration work done together with the, for the, with the CPRC hospitals with the SIMCA, which is the public health uh, uh, lab information system, with the e-notification system, and also the MySajatra app. This, uh, this system is being used actively by all our state, uh, uh, state and also our district health, uh, health office. As of 10 of June, as of yesterday, we had more than 552,000 cases registered into the system. Both positive and negative cases are registered since go live. Another system uh, is our surveillance dashboard. This is our CPRC COVID-19 surveillance dash dashboard, which, which is for improving our insights. And it is uh, overlays the COVID-19 patient database with existing geospatial data on MyHDW. MyHDW is our uh, Malaysian Health Data Warehouse. So the first two I, I presented was a new initiative. But this is leveraging on an existing system, an existing data warehouse. And it does visualization of facility locations, uh, geographical boundaries, population demographics. It's to generate new insights on high risk areas and population, as you see on the screen. Uh, there are also international figures. This is obtained through a collaborative effort between John Hopkins University Center for System Science and engineering and also SS3, which shares the ArchDIS living layer for public use, uh, for the public use. Another uh, initiative which we leveraged on our blood bank information system is the CPRC for the hospital system. 
which is also a data collection uh, tool with analytics and it is to improve planning and operations for hospital. It is proposed through a joint partnership between industry in collaboration with MOH and is leveraging on our existing blood bank information system which is, is on a cloud framework and platform and it supports data collection during this crisis. It uses Power BI for analytics and if you see on, the, on your screen, this is, the, this is the dashboard. So we quickly could develop a CPRC hospital system sitting on this blood bank information system and it was rolled out within two weeks. So this system is uh, to look into facility capacity in terms of hospital beds, ICU. It is, it's monitored daily at uh, 8, 8 a.m. in the morning and 5 p.m. in the evening. It also gives a supply chain visibility, PPEs and medical equipment in all our 40 hospitals, 40 treating hospitals. Lab utilization and supply region and, and for, the, for all the labs. And also, he also does clinical reporting for all COVID-19 patients who are admitted in the hospital. Another system which we leverage also uh, on an existing system is the HRS at KKM, uh, which is our own cloud-based uh, hospital information system. This is to improve the clinical and operational efficiency at MAIX. What is MAIX? MAIPS actually is an, is, an, uh, is, a exposition, is an agriculture exposition park which was converted to a COVID-19 low-risk quarantine and treatment center if you see on, at, at the bottom of the slide. It has a bed capacity of 604 and is used for admission of COVID-19 patients who are asymptomatic and mild. This is actually a makeshift hospital extension center and it's done through efforts of various agencies coming together and it was completed in a very short period of time. Uh, in, in fact, at one time it already it had a 100% uh, bid uh, uh, utilization. So this uh, HIS at KKM was also proposed by industry in collaboration with MOH. It leverages on our existing uh, hospital information system using cloud-based platform. And this hospital information system that is locally developed for MAH hospitals. Infrastructure and hardware was deployed rapidly and customization was also done rapidly and rolled out at MIPS to meet the requirement for uh, COVID-19. This includes the integration with the CPRC hospital system, integration with modality, MIPS has a uh, digital chest x-ray, Worklist drug orderable for pharmacy, especially drugs that is specific for COVID, and also all the swab test results. So if you see on the left is our this is the dashboard that uh, sorry is the system uh, and the log and the login page is there, and on the right side are how the system is being used at MIPS, and at the bottom is the center where it is converted to a low risk quarantine and treatment center. So basically, I have shown you five initiatives with two different kinds of approach. One is leveraging on an existing system, and the other one is totally a new initiative. But all this is done through collaborations, with, through interagency, interministry, and industry support. So in summary, I think we need to continue to strengthen the preparedness and response capacity. We need to continue to strengthen health system cap capability and digital read re readiness, enhance digital technology and innovation in COVID-19 response, harmonize the ongoing efforts of data collection. We must continuously enhance the multi-sectoral collaboration and coordination, and not forgetting we must strengthen the regional and international cooperation. So I think together in unity and solidarity, we can flatten the curve. So with that, I thank you and I open for any questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Fazila. So for our first question, uh, what were your top two challenges with information management during COVID? Uh, I think our top two challenges is first is because there were so many people were uh, collecting data and many of it was done manually. So that was our biggest challenge. 
uh, uh, manual data collection in the early days of the pandemic. But somehow, once we got the system and it was up and running, I think it was much easier. And, uh, and, and of course, train, change management and training is also required for that. And number two is, is the coordination that needs to be done. Uh, where if you see there are many players in this entire COVID-19 response and to bring all of them together. Initially, when we started, uh, our systems, we, we started, everyone was doing in silo. Then later we came all together because we had to do it rapidly. So everyone was going on silo. So later we all came together and put it in a big landscape and see where the integration point needs to be done. So I, I, I think that was the biggest challenge in information management. Thank you, Dr. Fazila. Our next question is, how does the MOH of Malaysia manage fake news? <laughs> oh, yeah, yes, fake news. Uh, our Director General just announced that the fake news is spreading faster than the virus. Yeah, so uh, the, we have an agent, we have a, a, a website where you can check whether the news is uh, fake or to refute the fake news. And every time there is a fake news, it is announced in the, on, on, the, uh, on, on social media. There is a, a, a app, sorry, there is a social media platform. Uh, we are using uh, Telegram and Viber and WhatsApp, which, is, which gives you current and updated information. Uh, the CPRC uh, group and also the National Security Council. And all fake news is an also announced uh, in, in social media and also mass media. Yes, social me uh, uh, fake news has, has been a, a big challenge for us. Our next question is, how does Malaysia interoperate several information systems during this COVID-19 response? Like, uh, like I mentioned earlier, we started uh, many of it with uh, doing in silo, but later we all got together and we see where the integration needs to be done and identified uh, and made sure all, every, all uh, in, uh, work together, all the teams work together and, uh, and identify the integration point, what needs to be shared and, and, and the work is going on now. So uh, integration now is being done between my Sajatra and also the e-COVID-19 and e-COVID-19 to the CPRC hospital and also integration work to the uh, HIS at KKM. So uh, some work is still in progress, but some integration has taken off and has gone live. Our next question is, what proportion, if any, of positive COVID-19 cases are quarantined in the home as compared to institution-based quarantine? If yes, how are they supported? Uh, no, uh, Malaysia's strategy is all uh, COVID-19 patient positive is uh, admitted. Yeah, so uh, no, no one is, no COVID-19 is managed at home. So that is the main strategy. So, but however, later in the pandemic, for those who are asymptomatic and mild, it's moved to these low risk uh, quarantine centers, low, low, low risk treatment centers. Our next question is How do you screen vulnerable populations other than migrant workers, like the elderly in private and government nursing homes, as well as inmates in the prisons? Yeah, uh, when we say, when we're talking about targeted approach, we are talking about vulnerable groups and also uh, high, uh, locality. We are also talking about localities. So in terms of vulnerable group, all uh, nursing homes, uh, we're talking about nursing homes and uh, religious schools, uh, also where, where the team, our team goes in and does the screening migrant uh, workers or in the area where there's an extend uh, uh, enhanced MCO. It's all where there all the uh, people on that locality are also screened. So our, our, our screening team goes to the site. Either it's done home, uh, home to home or it's done in a hall. So it's a massive task to, to do this. And also targeted approach is done also at the detention center and also at the prison when there is a positive case. 
So uh, uh, our approach has always been a targeted approach. Uh, so regarding the initiatives that you have shown for the COVID-19 response, will it be useful for the management of other infectious diseases like HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria as well? Uh, this is, that is actually a great question because the next question will be, what do we do with this system? How do we move forward with this, uh, uh, the, the digital landscape that has happened during this COVID? Can we repurpose this app? Can we repurpose some of the system to, uh, to address other conditions, if, if other infectious disease? Uh, what about non-communicable disease? We are also looking at if can my Sajatra app be used for uh, non-communicable disease and uh, monitoring. So these are the uh, next uh, few things that we really need to do moving forward. Another one is would be the business model, the sustainability of the system, the continuous upgrade. So there are so many of this. Uh, it's, it's amazing that in, within the five months, so many things happen and an entire digital landscape has, has been done. But I think moving forward is how do we sustain this landscape and how we repurpose this to be used for other conditions. So these are all the strategies that needs to be thought of as, as we move forward. In preparation for the next pandemic, what would you do first now that you have lessons from COVID-19? Let's hope there will be no more pandemics. I, I think that is the main question. That is the main thing. Uh, but I think this pandemic has actually taught us a lesson that we must be resilient and how we are going to, pre how we must be ever ready uh, in terms of crisis preparedness and response and how we must, uh, we must be agile in everything that we do. Uh, we must be fast and also uh, how we work together, public, private, uh, and what about uh, industry support? Uh, what about whole of government approach, whole of society? Uh, this whole thing has actually taught us a lot of lesson, you know, uh, including digital transformation, uh, including new norms. Uh, working from home was not possible before. Uh, virtual meetings, uh, virtual consultation, virtual clinics, it's all possible today. So moving forward, uh, these are a few things that I think we really have to relook, and a lot of things are actually possible. COVID-19 has actually taught us that many things are possible, and uh, multi uh, multi agency, multi uh, uh, inter sorry inter agency inter ministry collaboration is also important in moving forward. So these are the few lessons uh, in in uh, in preparing us for for whatever crisis that comes along. And digital readiness is also important. And uh, health literacy of the people, digital trust of the people. How do we improve communication? In, in fact, I, I think we, we can write a whole book of lessons learned in, in this uh, pandemic. And um, so this, these are the few things that I can think of uh, right now. And also, I think what's important is the skills, skill and expertise of our healthcare workers uh, in digital readiness, skill and expertise uh, in many things are also uh, important in this. Another th lesson, I think, uh, is we really had a supply chain uh, disruption, major supply chain disruption. So um, moving forward, uh, our dependence, dependence on uh, PPEs and medical equipment, uh, uh, impo uh, imports. So that this is uh, also uh, another thing that we must really think of. And then what about regional collaboration in innovation, regional collaboration in, uh, in research? Um, yeah, I can go on and on what are the lessons learned. So, but these are some of the things that came, off, or came on my uh, thinking right now. How did you manage industry partners who were eager to help? We had amazing, amazing support from the industry, amazing support from all the other agencies and ministries. And, they were, and the amount of uh, even CSR that was done during this period was, was just unbelievable. 
so many of the industries actually came forward to support us. And I think everyone had this one goal to flatten the curve. And uh, I, I think uh, and a lot of things was possible during this, during this uh, five months. Many systems went live in, in, in days and weeks, which was, is not possible in, in any other time. So uh, it, it was very agile. So these are, these are the things, I think this is the lesson to learn that, that this can be done actually, you know. So uh, we hope in moving forward, uh, uh, we, we must find, we must do long-term strategy and planning in, in uh, especially in digital response and also in system implementation and how we can do it better and faster. And, in, and also investment in research and innovation, I think is also very important uh, in, in any uh, healthcare system. What do you think encouraged the private sector partners to collaborate and share in the many initiatives that have successfully gone while putting their own needs aside? Like, like, like I say, I think everyone had one goal uh, to, to contain this pandemic and, and everyone was together in it. I, I think that was the main goal. And to and uh, and everyone was very generous during this time, and I think crisis brings everyone together. That is what uh, I think it is, uh, and uh, we really hope that we can continue to have this whole of government, whole of society approach, and also more and more industry uh, collaboration uh, between uh, and also public and private partnership. Even we had so much support from the university hospitals, the defense, which are all our other public health sector uh, uh, stakeholders, the private sectors, uh, the private labs. Uh, it, 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 it was, uh, I presented yesterday, you know, it, it is like an orchestra. It, it was the entire orchestra and, and uh, all came together. And it was a beautiful song at the end of the day. How did the people respond with the measures implemented by the Ministry of Health or the government in general? Measures mean, uh, you mean people meaning uh, the citizens, I, I'm, I'm assuming. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It, it, was, it was a big challenge at the beginning, you know, to make uh, people, because we were also learning. I, I think uh, everyone was learning. This was new. Uh, we start. We didn't really understand uh, the the nature of, of this uh, disease, and as we get more and more information and uh, evidence, and you know, so a lot of guidelines, clinical protocols, it came, it came, it, it changed very fast, and, uh, and and to so we had a very consistent factual uh, information to the public. And it, it was also done by just one person, which is the Director General of Health. So I, I think that was, uh, I, I think it was a, a fantastic uh, communication uh, strategy. And uh, yeah, we, ha we had uh, trouble in the early phases, but slowly I think people started to understand, started to understand uh, what is social distancing, started to understand the importance of uh, keeping your hands clean, uh, about a mask and uh, about so many things and this message is it's uh, it's said in a consistent manner in all social media mass media tv radios you know um so slowly you see uh, uh, the people understand actually you know but of course there are also some who 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 go against the uh, sops and, and so forth but more and more, as you see, that we are flattening the curve with very much less local transmission. I think everyone is in this together. And I think now everyone will have to adapt and adopt the new norms. Uh, and uh, and I, I think they are, they, they are quite used to it. Yeah. You also mentioned online consultations. So were there any increase in adoption of telemedicine and how did the Ministry of Health support it? Uh, we, uh, of course, for the virtual consultation, we collaborated with a few online platforms that was already available. And uh, 
the uptake is, is good. Now more and more people are using virtual consultation. But in our post-MCO or post-movement control order uh, strategy, uh, we are moving towards uh, uh, virtual consultation. We are moving towards bringing service back to uh, community, to individuals and to homes. Uh, so that's another strategy we are looking at. Uh, of course, a lot of virtual meetings is, is occurring now, and uh, so I, I think that uh, people are people will slowly accept this, and it is easy. You you can consult your doctors sitting in your own home, and uh, we are really going to push this hard for a virtual consultation. And uh, moving forward for the next six months, I think we will. We will uh, do it in all our health clinics at primary care and then followed by our virtual consultations at the hospitals. Um, there, is a, there are some service disruption in the COVID hospitals. So there are some uh, backlog in cases. And we are hoping that with virtual consultation and moving forward, I, I think we should be able to catch up. Uh, so right now, uh, digital readiness of the hospitals and clinics are very important. Uh, bandwidth is, is important. And finding the right platform uh, for virtual consultation is important. But not forgetting, we must ensure uh, privacy, uh, safety, and the legal, uh, the regulatory uh, part is it's taken care of. Yeah, so that is our plan in, in moving forward. Teaching MOH staff nationwide how to use a new application is difficult. So how did you do this? Uh, the, oh, yeah. Yes, it is difficult. So when, for example, for the CPRC hospital system, we actually started, uh, they started manually. Some were using Excel, some were using Google uh, Sheets and, and so forth. So when we started, we started first uh, in phases, started with the headquarters where we still receive the information uh, from the hospitals through, uh, through the usual manner and then we key it in and then slowly we start opening up uh, to, for hospitals to key in themselves. So I, I think it has to be done in a gradual manner. It cannot just be uh, straight away to use the system. So training is done, uh, change management is very important. But many of the, but the system is quite friendly, so it can be done quite fast. And for the HIS at KKM at the quarantine center, at the low risk quarantine center, or we call it MIPS, uh, training is done. Training is done for the first uh, one week with user acceptance uh, test was also done. After training, then we went live and the uh, MIPS was open for the patient. So we did all the training and the readiness first before we received the patient. Uh, so that's how uh, it's being done. And as for the MySajatra app, it's a, it's a very user-friendly app. It can be downloaded and uh, it, it's quite easy to use. So we had not much problem in terms of community or people using it. Uh, and we kept, we, we, uh, the team is improving its functionality and added more function as it went on. So now we are already in the few uh, versions ahead. Next is to see the roadmap for this app and how it's going to be used further or repurposed further in, uh, in, in, uh, in future. Was it difficult to train your staff and how much did you think it prevented staff infection? A train, uh, is it in system or? Implementation, Dr. Fazila, was the staff training difficult to implement? I'm assuming this question is for the, for the, for the system, for the IT system. I, I've mentioned, like as I mentioned earlier, it, it, it is quite easy to use. So we did it gradually and uh, uh, the st that it's not the entire hospital that uses the data collection system. It's done by the hospital operations center or by the specific uh, identified person that is trained to use it in the ICU and also uh, in the COVID ward. So it is not used by all the staff. But for the MIPS, it's used by all the staff and they, they undergo a proper training before the, they use the system. So when uh, there's a new staff that comes in, in that is posted to MIPS, uh, the, low, uh, the low risk center, they have to undergo the training of the system before they start work.
Uh, yes, Dr. Fazila. Uh, there's a follow-up question to that. So how much did you think it prevented uh, staph infection? We are talking about uh, training in terms of uh, exposure to healthcare workers. Yes, all of them undergo uh, infection and prevention control training before they are posted to the COVID ward, if that is what the question uh, is talking about. Uh, uh, they get full training of IPC training, infection prevention control training, and also uh, occupational safety and health training to prevent them, uh, to protect them from exposure to, uh, to infection. How did Malaysia manage stoppage of schools or continuity of education? Okay, uh, yes, during MCO, only essential services uh, was open. All schools and institutions, uh, higher education institution is closed until today. Uh, the new uh, SOP, uh, Operating Procedure for Schools, uh, has, was released two days ago. And I, uh, sorry, yesterday. And the schools will be reopened on the uh, 24th of June. But however, it will be done in phases. Uh, we'll start with the upper secondary and I think and so far it will go. But all the schools were all the schools and the institution and uh, and the higher education institution are all closed. But on but our education continues online, and many of them are doing it virtually. And um, I think many of the major exams were also put on hold, like the O levels and the A levels, uh, which is coming, which is also on hold. Uh, so we are really hoping now the education will continue, will start. And uh, hopefully by end, of, uh, by end of June, with the new uh, operating procedures, uh, we will start school. Edu education will start soon. However, some of the trainings, especially our houseman trainings for and also our master students training in hospital has started. Did you face challenges with privacy? Oh yes, especially when we were using my Sajatra in the initial phase, uh, we had a lot of uh, issues. Uh, the trust, uh, the trust of the people is, I think is very important. Uh, issues of, and then when we are using contact tracing, you know, privacy, how do you balance privacy, security versus public health? Uh, issues, um, but I think uh, we we have to uh, give uh, we have to give reassurance to the people that uh, we adhere to security standards. We adhere to the Personal Data Protection Act. Uh, we have PDPA in Malaysia, and also and uh, I think another trust is that this gover uh, this app was actually uh, was done with multi government agencies led by Ministry of Health and also uh, the National Security Council. I think that is very important. And uh, the My Sajatra app oh, is the secretariat is, uh, is under NAPSA, which is the National Agency for Cybersecurity. So a lot of cybersecurity and security uh, measures was put in to ensure that privacy is, is, uh, is adhered to, yeah. How does Malaysia manage agencies that build apps that have similar functions such as screening and contact tracing? Okay, um, the amount of application that we have received a proposal, I think uh, it's, um, of, if, I, if I can count, it is definitely more than 20 to 30, which we receive almost daily from uh, uh, from agencies or industries in the country and also international and global. Uh, but uh, what uh, Malaysia has done is we have uh, created a digital enablement task force, which is under the National Security Council. And this task force, the Secretariat is the national agency uh, for the cybersecurity along with MAMPU. MAMPU is the ICT arm of the government. So in this digital enablement task force, it's actually a task force that is, uh, uh, Ministry of Health is one of them. And all uh, proposal that is technology, uh, technology based proposal that is horizontal in nature, uh, that is used for contact tracing goes through this task force. Uh, so this is how this is managed. And I think this task force is the one that will evaluate and see if there is potential uh, in, in collaborating so it, uh, the task force is still on and it's still going on. 
Uh, it's not only in contact tracing, we also got a lot of proposals in uh, robotics, in 3Ds, uh, in AIs. It, it's, it's, it's just amazing. And, and everything goes through this. Uh, some will go through uh, the research team and some goes through the digital enablement task force. But when it's vertical in nature, that means it's only used for our hospitals or our clinics, then, then the Ministry of Health will, will look at it. So that's, that's how it's, it's done. It, it really needs to be coordinated and, and, uh, uh, and, and needs a task force to look at it. So for the last question, what advice can you give to AHIN members, many of whom are officials from the Ministry of Health like yourself? Okay, uh, I know there are some of you, some of you may be new to this AHIN, but there are many AHIN members online today. I think uh, our goal in GAPS, which is governance, architecture, process and standards is very important. I think uh, as health, uh, as IT, uh, sorry, as we are doing a lot in digital health and innovation, I think it's important that we all work together at regional level and at global level. There's so many uh, things that we can share, uh, so many knowledge uh, we can uh, share too, and also experiences. And uh, moving forward, I think all health systems is looking into integration, vertical, horizontal integration, public-private integration. So the basics of GAPS is very important. And that is what AHIN is all about, the focus on GAPS, which is governance. You must have a proper governance, uh, proper architecture, uh, processes in place, and also standards to follow. Uh, so this is my advice to the GAPS, uh, to our AHIN members. And I think that we should all uh, continue this networking and uh, we should all continue to share uh, knowledge and share experience. Yeah, that is my advice to AHIM members. And I hope those, all the others who are not on AHIM, perhaps you can check it out and see if we can all uh, work together in, in this uh, agenda of digital health and innovation. Thank you so much, Dr. Fazila. Also to our participants for actively participating in the session. Thank you for sending in questions to enrich our discussion. So before we close, I would like to call on Dr. Bunchai. Thank you very much, Dr. Fazila. You are the uh, superstar of the AHIM. <laughs> and then uh, we are very proud of uh, our, uh, uh, our uh, cover governing uh, committee member, Dr. Fazila. She, uh, you, 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 you heard uh, all uh, the participants. Now you uh, have listened to the true expert. And she is not only expert in Malaysia, but also among our regional. Thank you very much. And we will need you uh, uh, squeeze your more knowledge uh, to our network. Thank you. Thank you, Bunchai. Thank you very much. Bye. Good night. Thank you. Thank you for participating. Bye. Good night. Bye. Bye.